graduation and Android development. Um, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working on Android for about two years now. Um, I spent the last year at Twitter working on the Android app and adding service related features. Before that, I worked on the NDK library using, um, I did a voiceover library using the NDK tools. Um, so that's basically my background in Android. Let's go over what we're going to talk about today. Oh, by the way, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, if you have questions and stuff, just send it to me. Alright, so we're going to cover some of the fragmentation points that we see uh, in Android. A lot of you would probably know about it already. Some of them will be hopefully new to you. We'll see. Um, we're going to cover some of the battles we face at Twitter and some of the steps we've taken to make life easier. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to leave some time for Q&A. Cool. Um, how many of you have seen the Open Signals report about fragmentation? Just one? Okay, well, for those of you who haven't seen it, this, this wonderful diagram shows like all the devices out there right now. Each rectangle is a particular model of phone. The larger the rectangle, the more of those devices are there. So as you can see, there's a lot of routes out there on the screen. Actually, OpenSignal says that there's 12,000 unique devices out there, unique Android devices out there right now, compared to 4,000 <coughs> last year. Let's look at the other differences that we have. Screen sizes. Each one of these rectangles represent the screen size of the Android device you can see. The darker the blue, the more of those devices are out there. There's over 50 different screen sizes you worry about. On top of that, there are manufacturer differences. How many of you have Samsung phones? HTC, U, okay. Sony, Nexus, yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah, so as you can see, there's a wide variety. There's actually a lot more. There's a Wii, there's GTE, phones that we don't sometimes see in the US. So what happens is, with all the OEMs, except for the differences that you, the user sees on the upper level with the new UI and all of that, they actually make changes in the Android stack, which may affect your other developer. They also have SDKs out there that provide some of the features that they've added. Um, and then sometimes they just have fundamental differences, like for example, the Kindle has a different notification service all together from Amazon. On top of that, phones have hardware differences. There are phones with hardware buttons. As we know, some phones don't have any buttons. Some phones will have different buttons. There's a search button. There's a menu button on some of the older devices. Actually, some of the newer devices seem to have it once in a while. So it's, it's pretty in this, and like, there are just differences. Uh, the camera support's different. Uh, as you know, some phones have a camera only in the back. Actually, it's rare now to find a phone that way. Um, there's like GPS different differences and all that. So there are a lot of differences, including hardware keyboard that iPhone developers don't have to worry about, but you might want to. What about the Android stack? There are eight different API levels out there right now that are in the market being used. <coughs> Jelly Bean has managed to spread a little faster, so it covers almost 50% of the market share. And, but a three-year-old gingerbread device has one-fourth of the market share still. And you can still, there's like a small percentage of Royal users out there. I mean, it's just the way it is. There's a lot of coverage, a lot of devices out there, a lot of software stuff. How many of you over here use Twitter? Only a little bit here. Anybody tweeted about the November 11, 2011? No? Really? Well, I did. And, like, <laughs> if you did tweet about it, you're a dot on the screen. And as you can see in the globe, uh, there's a lot of Twitter users out there. It was like one of those events that everybody tweeted. And the spread, as you can see, we cover a lot of countries. And that means each region has different devices. Some devices that you may not see in the US, you might not see in Europe, you might not see in Asia. So, widespread of users across the globe. Our Android user base compared to what we see in Google, is very, very similar. We have a little bit more Jelly Bean users, but we have about one quarter gingerbread users, just like we saw in Google Play. Um, in our databases, we see about 26,000 unique combination of hardware and software. And this is just Android. So there's lots of different phones out there. What we also see is a lot of the older devices, they are on longer. Like, we find really old devices once in a while. It's like, oh wow, I forgot that existed. Like Nexus One. Still shows up quite a few. At Twitter, we want to be the global town square. So we want to make sure we bring Twitter to as many people as possible. We want more people involved in it, more people be having access to it. So we work towards making sure we support this fragmentation issue and still provide Twitter for everyone. So how do we manage? 
constraining all these fragmentation points, where do we start? What are some of the things that we should consider? So if you're working on a new feature, what we found out is that asking three questions, three simple questions, makes it a little bit easier to go forward. First question is, what is the key feature of that? If you're looking to make something that needs GPS, your phone has to have GPS. So if you're doing it on a tablet that doesn't have GPS, you're already leaving them behind. If you need a camera support, tablets that don't have camera or phones that don't have camera won't be able to consent. Next is, what's the minimum API level these features are viable by? So for example, if you're using NFC, which was introduced only in Gingerbread and so you have to make sure that, okay, my app will work on Gingerbread and not. And like, so for your users will be left behind. You might be okay with that because the feature is just not available to them. And finally, what are the legacy devices you're comfortable leaving behind? <coughs> now this is a trick question because even though they're legacy, you might want to cover them, but like you need to have more information to understand what you can do. So one of the things that makes it easier is knowing your user base. So going back to the Twitter Android users that we have, you can see that Honeycomb and Eclair is a small sliver of users out there. So with that in mind, we can comfortably say that, okay, maybe this new feature will not show up to Honeycomb users. Maybe this new feature will not show up to Eclair. Because the development time for it is so long that it would leave behind every other user while we wait for those for platforms. So one thing to consider. Speaking of, who do we actually support? Twitter for Android, all versions out there right now, at least support Froyo and not. We have put Declare in maintenance mode, so which means that no new features are going in there, but we still support them. If there's crashes, if there's issues, we'll fix them when we stop fixes. And if you're wondering, the reason we dropped Declare is the same reason we saw before. The, the user base was small, and their development time was growing. We've also released this project called Android for All. Android for All targets medium density devices. These devices are typically low in Android, and they are considered low in Android because they have memory limitations and also size limitations on their screen or display resolution. So to do that, we wanted to make sure that they have a good experience and they do not end up in a position where installing our app stops them from installing other apps because of the memory limitations. So one thing we do, we include only the medium density assets. The more assets your app needs, the more space you need, especially if you want to cover all the different densities that are supported. As you know, there is medium density, high density, and then there is apparently extra, extra high density out there too. So, and the, the more denser the resolution, the more bigger the assets, so you get the idea. We also dropped the support for photo filters. Turned out the photo filters was just not performing in that kind of a device. So we dropped the support for it so that our users can at least tweet photos without worrying about filtering it. And it worked out great. What did we manage in then? Android for All is currently about 4 megabytes, which makes it pretty amazing for these devices that has 32 megabytes of RAM in most cases. All right, let's talk about what we can do. So there are some quick wins that we can have just by uh, adding <coughs> double. Things that we consider, um, just norm, just out of the box. So one of the things that you want to worry about is the different screen sizes and the orientation. Your phone can be portrait, it could be a landscape. Just by using display independent pixel and scale independent pixel, you can actually get a lot out of it. So display independent pixel is basically, a, if you think of it as a one-to-one -one pixel uh, for medium density, that's, you can use the same size and it would scale nicely for all the higher density. And Scale independent pixels that you use for text. So if you use that for all the text sizes, you can go into Android and say, I want my text bigger, and your app will automatically adapt to it. Here's an example. Do you guys see any differences between the two? So what's amazing is that you can see the layout of both of them are pretty similar. The position of the tweets, even the height of the tweets and everything, it actually looks almost identical. Whereas the screen on the right is a 1080p screen, and the screen on the left is a 720p. Only differences are just using the nice display and dependent pixels for sizes. What else is there? Android tools support a resource overlay system that you can use to support all these various things. And one of the things that 
we use that for is for multiple languages. It's actually really easy to have your app support multiple languages um, in general. But so let's dive into it a little bit more. Twitter for Android supports 37 different languages. We have a translation standard completely supported by community translators. We love them for it. They have made Twitter for Android available in all these different languages. Um, the few languages that are a little out of the norm for support are the <coughs> RTL languages. For example, Arabic, Farsi, and Hebrew. Those are the three support languages we have. Actually, um, if you guys have any questions about the Translation Center, please meet us by the booth. Um, after the talk, anytime you're in, we'll be able to you. Here's an example tweet. This tweet is in Hebrew. Anybody use Hebrew? Um, anyway, so this Hebrew tweet, as you can see, is right to left, the text of the tweet itself, which is great for, the, for a Hebrew tweet. However, these readers, they're used to the flow of the app to also be right to left. So there are things we can do to make it easier for them, so that they feel more at home. Let's just focus on the avatar over here. Here's the style that we use for the avatar. As you can see, we have defined the size of the avatar, we have defined the positioning, and some padding around it. Simple stuff. To have it supported for RTL, one thing that we do is we subclass the style and change only the necessary attributes. Here's the change. So this subclass, as you can see, only thing we adjusted is the padding, the position of the avatar. We left the sizes behind because we're inheriting that from the parent. Doing so and the other necessary changes for this particular view, we end up with a tweet that looks like that. It just flows better. They are used to this, they want to read right to left, and it's just presented right to left. How is this used in the layout itself? So here's the layout for left to right languages. Notice I highlighted the style that's being used on the avatar. Only thing we did is name the avatar and we applied the style. On the right to left layout for this particular thing, the only change that we really have is just the style change. So if you do the layout and you use the layout over the resource overlay features for the Android build tools, all I did is I mentioned that, okay, this particular layout is for Arabic with the AR, and we're also versioning it, and I'll get into speed over that one for uh, Jilly and up, and saying that this is what we support. There are obviously other changes as you see as we're leaving out the rest of them, like the username and all of that. But we're just focusing that here. So what do we know about right to left? Here's what it looks like in the full conversation. Uh, we were just focused on the middle view right there. So we know that the right to left support came in Jellybean and Newark. So you just have to make sure you focus target on that. Um, you, if you have it for the lower devices, they may not support it properly, so things will just look funky. So it's very easy to play safe. Um, we share as much layouts as possible between our LPR and our left to right and the right to left layouts, and we use styles for differences as much as possible, so that way it copies up easily. There are four different language codes that we support. Yes, there's four languages, language codes right there, but there's only three languages. Um, that's just because some Android phones define Hebrew as HE, and others define it as ISU. Um, but because of that, we support four different language codes. And one of the things that we did that I'll cover later on is uh, with the help of Braille, we actually only have the layouts for Arabic. And during compile time, we'll copy it over to Farsi and Hebrew. And that way, we don't have to make sure we maintain five different copies of the layout. One thing that helps us a lot while testing this is using a debug setting that allows us to choose whatever language we want. We actually use it a lot for making sure that things are translated properly. We also use it to make sure our right to left languages lay out nicely and it just didn't run into any random errors. All right, what's next? We've gone through the screen sizes and orientations, we've done the multiple languages. One big amazing quick win that you can get is just by using Android support libraries. Android support libraries are amazing. Just think about it. You, Fragments was introduced in Honeycomb and Fragments makes life so easy, so easy to organize code but you have to have to target honeycomb or not. 
and those support libraries, libraries make sure that they backport this all the way down, and so you can actually have it in there. In fact, we do. We have it on our Twitter for Android app, and it works great. It makes sure that you know we share the same code, and we have really good modularity between the codes. If you're looking for some features that that are used in the higher ones, and you want to go back, you, I suggest digging into the support libraries. It comes in handy. Notifications, for example, you can get the feature and it degrades next to the older. One of the things we use is the view pager, which actually lives only in the support library. It makes it easy for us to make the swipeable timeline that we have on the home. We also use it for user gallery and search results, and we use it for your profile bio. By the way, Pavan and Muhammad over here, these guys are amazing. They make sure that we don't make the app, and they've done a lot of work on Twitter for actually. So the key thing here to remember is Use the, what's provided to you with the tools, let them do the heavy lifting, and you can easily get some of the big wins. The support libraries are great, I suggest diving into it for some of the features you want. And you know, and you also find things that are actually not available in different API levels. It's only about available in the support libraries, like the few here. So let's go over some of the things that we ran into at Twitter. Earlier this year, we introduced the Android look and feel for the app. With that, we started using an action bar. We really wanted the user to feel at home with all the new designs. And we wanted to use the action bar as much as possible. However, action bar compat was not yet available, and we wanted to have all our users move into this new direction. We decided not to use the action bar Charlock, which is which was out there at the moment. Um, it was mostly because we wanted the jelly meat, the gingerbread users to feel more at home in gingerbread. So we wanted them to have the same look and feel while getting new features. So what did we end up doing? We knew that there is no support for gingerbread in Action Bar. We knew that there was no expansion in Honeycomb. Honeycomb, you can have an expanded box already, but otherwise you can just have a menu icon. There's no expansion in that. There are also some subtle differences between Ice Cream Sandwich and Jelly Bean. Turns out that that didn't really affect us as much. It was more from the user's perspective of how they felt. So jumping into Jelly Bean, what did we do? We just used the action bar. It had all the features that we wanted. We were able to have a search expanded box, and we had rich interactions with the drop down. It just worked out great. It worked great also in Ice Cream Sandwich. It just worked. For Gingerbread, however, we had to do some work. We created a pseudo compatibility board for Action Bar, and we made sure that we, we wrote all the code to do the search bar expansion, and we used to share a lot of the code for the rich interactions for the top down. And so we brought a, a functionality that wasn't available in Gingerbread by doing all this additional work. And that way, you know, the users felt more at home in Gingerbread and also um, had the new features. Honeycomb was a different story. Honeycomb had action. So we didn't really want to give them the old network. We wanted them to have action bar. But then they didn't have a search bar, such search bar expansion, which was something we were aiming for. And also, as I mentioned before, because the user base is so small, after spending a little bit of time, and we realized that it would require a lot of effort to do something like this, we decided to leave them with the feature set that they have and move forward. This is one of the examples that I've talked about, like you know, where you go forward and provide new features to a certain set of users. So what did they miss? They were using the native search, Android search feature that we had previously. So all that was great. We were using the action bar, so that worked out nicely. So the only thing they really missed is the rich interactions on the top down, because with the Android native search, you only have certain things. So, how did the code look for initializing something like this? Here's our action bar helper being initialized. As you can see, a lot of the checks is about what version of the API level you're in, and depending on that, you just launch the particular class that we have. Action bar compat was the pseudo compatibility layer that we wrote for Gingerbread. And then Honeycomb had its own little layer because there's there's a lot of things that just wasn't there, and then ice cream sandwich and jelly beans just work together. One of the 
something that we learned, something that we didn't consider would affect this, is hardware buttons. There was an issue with the search button and the action bar, using them together. It wasn't that much of an issue, it's more like a feature that we wanted to have. So there were a lot of phones out there that still had a hardware search button. We wanted this to still expand the search box, and instead of jumping to the native Android search. So we had to make sure to worry about that. So those are like just some of the things that you may or not consider, but you know, they come in like just because of the way the different devices are there. The other thing is the menu button. If your phone has a menu button, there's no overflow menu. Now, Action Bar actually takes care of that, which means that if you're a new user who didn't know this, and your phone has a as a menu button, sometimes people don't realize that they have all these other options that are hidden in there. Especially with the newer phones, like a lot of people that they're moving on, they don't realize that they have additional options in that. So things, just things to consider. All right, let's talk about some of the things in, about databases. As you have the different API levels, each API level phone out there, in fact, it actually sometimes varies from manufacturers. Because they'll have different versions of SQLite on their phone. So which means that what you think is supported may or may not work. So we suggest testing in the lowest supporting API for your app, because that would be the lowest supporting version for, uh, for SQLite. How many of you attended uh, yesterday's talk about optimizing Twitter? Okay, all right. Um, if you remember, Liam gave that talk, she's in there, by the way. Um, she gave the talk, so just to recap, we introduced this new Discover timeline uh, sometime earlier this year, where we blended tweets and users together. Because of that, we had this complicated view table that we created um, that would make sure that the provider would give us the information that we need. Now, this in involved a lot of joins, and to optimize it, instead of joining the views, we actually joined the table. It was great. It actually gave us a good performance boost. It was, it, like, as Nian mentioned, we saved some close to 100, 100 operations right there. However, what was interesting is that in Eclair, it wasn't quite the case. It actually didn't work out that well. It was too complicated, and it could not process it, and we would crash when we go to discover it. So for Eclair users, we actually have to roll back this change and go back to using the views and so merging the case. So just some things to consider. Things that you don't think come in play, but they do. The SQLite version over here was just older and clear, and it ran into this issue. All right, let's talk about native libraries. Um, as you know, Android is kind of available in ARM, mostly, and then in Dips and Intel also. And technically, anybody can compile it to any platform, but those are the supported iterations right now. So, if you're making a NDK library, uh, a library based on NDK, so a native code, you have to remember that you have to provide it for each architecture that's up there. So that means that if you're building, uh, say, when I work on the voice variety library, I have to make sure it's compiled in ARM and x86 and, and Intel and NIPS, all of them, because we were letting other people use it and we did not know what kind of hardware they were going for. So there's things you can provide. Now, as an app developer, however, um, it's a little bit more important because you're providing it to the end user. You kind of know what you're targeting. So you can target the ARM users and get most of the market share, but if you want to cover everybody, you have to provide the MIPS and the Intel things. So the big difference for this is that it would increase the, either the size of your APK or the complexity of how you're publishing. Let me go into a little bit about it. Like basically, in Google Play, if you're releasing an app, you can use multiple APK versions and target it to the different architectures, but then that would mean that you're building the APK for the different architectures. So if you're actually supporting all the three devices, you have three different APKs right there. So you have to publish three different APKs every time you release an app. Three different APKs to test, three different APKs to upload, three different APKs. It's just complex, and it can get more and more complex depending on what other restrictions you have. Uh, but the flip side is, you can increase the size of the APK if you combine everything together. Most cases, the most apps will just combine all the APKs because they're like they don't increase the size as much. But a big thing is if your code is native, like if your app is mostly written in native code, 
uh, in my case, it's like a lot. For example, video games. Uh, a lot of the games that you have, uh, they would do a lot of these things to make sure that the download size is not too much. We use photo filters for um, in our app, and that's mostly developed in the native country. What we found out is that while it was amazingly fast, there were some random things that we run into. There were issues of different photos that we just couldn't recognize, photos that we just refused to load. Um, and then there were like differences like, in the sense that, for example, there are some photos from Samsung just didn't work. And then there were like random failures in photos. There was a particular case I remember where we had an Xperia phone that would just crash. Um, however, we have fixed all of these, and the way we get about doing it is just making sure that we try it out in all the different devices. So there are a lot of exceptions in our code um, that covers a lot of these devices, and as we test through them, we find that there are some various simple differences here and there. With the, with the other thing that we did, like as I mentioned for Android for all, we just didn't have the photo filters. Um, we actually just got it by simply doing auto degradation if the libraries are not there. If the libraries are not there, we just jump to the tweet uh, instead of allowing you to filter the photos. <coughs> What's next? You've developed your app. You've uh, made sure you consider as many quick things as you can get and actually invested in some of them. Um, what are some of the things to do to make sure that we keep on having this development cycle going forward, have these features set. One thing that helps us a lot is testing. We test in various different API levels to make sure that our apps work in fine and all the API levels that we support. We also test it in multiple languages. As I mentioned before, we switch back and forth using the debug settings. We actually have some devices that are just running in one of the other languages. And what we found that was amazing was having various manufacturer devices in the play. Um, it's just that there's the subtle differences in Android stack sometimes makes so much of a difference that you don't realize until you actually run into it. So what helps us a lot for all of these is having UI automation, which um, using the UI automation, we actually run all the tests in the device lab, and we basically have a widespread of devices to make sure that we cover um, all our bases. Um, one of the things that we do is we go through our logs and we find the, the top devices that are there, so we know that those are most impacted and we're testing more. All right, so you <coughs> set up your testing, you release your app. Support is another case where you want to worry about. And this is just simple. Um, anyone of you over here use crash tapes? Um, so, people who don't know, Crash Analytics is this crash reporting program, and it actually helps us a lot, because what we do is, we, as soon as we release the app, we listen to the feed out there, and we see that um, all the crashes coming in that we know, or like there's new crashes coming in we know. What's amazing about Crash Analytics, other than the fact that they're real-time crash reports, is the amount of information that you get. Here's an example of the Crash Analytics dashboard. This crash, as you can see, has happened over a million times. There's about a million users who are impacted. Maybe high volume crashes. It's actually one of our old top crashes. Um, what's more important is the fact that you can see all the manufacturer devices that are involved with this and the different API levels that are impacted. You can actually also get the, how, many, how much uh, free space you have in your disk, the orientation of the screen, or even if the phone's rooted.
Now, as I mentioned before, the multi-API, multi-APK release in Google Play that you need to, um, it requires some tricks and versions. So, here's an example that we found and we use, and this is from like devandroid.com. Um, what they use is they use numeric namespacing. So, what does that mean? Um, the example that they have is this. So, as you can see, they have, they're taking into consider, consideration the API level, the screen size, the display density, and then they're using about three digits for a version. So the idea is that if you're targeting a particular level, you mention it, and then <laughs> once you go down to everything else, all the things considered, you still have about a thousand um, different releases before you need to bump the number up again. The reason being that every time you update something in Google Play, it has to be higher than the previous release. If your gap is too small, at certain points, you need to bump it up high enough so that your the whole lower APKs don't crash with the release that we already had before. Here's an example of it working. So let's say we have this release app. So we have a clear supporting MVPI devices. I'm just randomly pulling numbers for the density here, like MVPI being 1, ACPI being 2, etc. And say the version number is 50. We have the same release for Jelly Bean and Up. So as you can see, the API level is 10. And then we have the same release for ice cream sandwich. All great, there's a lot of gap between them. And now as we're updating, let's say a few months later, this is what our version looks like. So as you can see, we've done four different updates in Eclair with the MVVM devices. We've done about 25 updates for Gingerbread. But we've only made like one update. <coughs> it can happen, but this way the gaps are large enough so you can actually release one without stopping another one. That's all I have for today. Um, I just want to finish by saying that we understand is that these phones are made differently for different people, and people like it. It's like the diversity of the thing, so it brings in fragmentation that we have to worry about, but it also brings in the diversity that we have. So, thank you.
you know, adding a tri-catch block like that does add extra overhead to the code. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. So the way I understood virtually, right, so if each release of Twitter ha might have I mean, several APKs deployed right. in the Play Store, one for each version of it. Right. And, uh, and so part of your build is actually to produce those different APKs, right? That's what it's That's correct, right, yeah. So what's the difference in some of these? Because uh, the way you described, uh, you know, solving fragmentation issues via the source files and things like that. Right. So, for example, like, that's why, like, when I talk about Android for All, um, Android for All is that separate APK that we release. Um, that's because we want the APK attack as well. So that one we release on its own as um, as a separate, you know, separate version level. So, say we run into a crash that's only affecting Android for all, and we want to hotfix that one, and it doesn't affect the regular release that we have. So, in, in, in that instance, we'll actually uh, generate a new APK for Android for all. We test it out, and then we'll the release, and the version numbers will pop up.